We were made to work. We were created not to lounge around, not to just, you know, go go get a boat and, 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 and sit out on the lake and fish. No. God has work for each and every one of us. In um uh, in the book of Proverbs, chapter thirteen. Now, I hope you brought your Bibles. My, I, I marked mine. I just have to give me a second again. Proverbs thirteen and eleven says, "Wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by his labor increases it." You want to be wealthy? Work, work hard. Um, my, my dad used to say to me, I didn't understand it. He said to me, Tom, work and luck go hand in hand. So what do you mean, Pop? He said, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Think about that. That's, that's a uh, poor Richard's almanac kind of thing. But there's some, some sense in it. We also see in, in Proverbs 14 and verse 23, in all labor there is profit. But mere talk leads only to poverty. Mere talk leads only to poverty. Somebody coined this phrase. After all is said and done, more gets said than done. And that's the problem. We talk about it, but we don't, don't ever get to do it. We have a someday mentality. Yep, someday I'm going to do that. Someday. Today, folks, is someday. Sunday and it's someday. Um, well, you know, what, what, what can we learn from a man who was blessed with the greatest wisdom from God? Now, if I asked you who that was, you're all going to tell me Jesus. But Jesus didn't get wisdom from God. He was wisdom of God. Amen. But the man that got blessed by God with wisdom was Solomon. And Solomon had some great words for us in the book of Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes 3, 9, and 10, he tells us, What profit, or he asks the question, What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? You know, that's a valid question. I work all day. For why? You know? Um, there's another scripture that says, um, You know, we, we, we work for our wages and we put it in a bag with all. If we don't honor God with it. Um, he asked that question, you know, what is it profit to work or should we just hang out? Well, he answers it back in chapter 2. And, and he, he says things um, in a way that they really should provoke us, us to think. Um, in Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 2, verses 18 and 19, and you can write the references down and look them up later, but he says, Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Solomon not only was the wisest man in the world, history records he was the richest man in the world, but he was miserable. His riches didn't do it for him. And who knows, after leaving it to the man who will come after me, who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. You work to gather it, and somebody else gets to spend it. Doesn't sound like a great plan. But he saw the futility of our earthly labor. Ecclesiastes um, 18 and 19 just sums it up. Who are you going to leave it to? And what, what did you gather it for? But God didn't leave us in despair. He gave us another work, another labor. He gave us a kingdom labor. And here's your assignment. And, and you can write these down and look them up, but I'm going to read them to you. Here's your assignment in the kingdom. Here's the work that God has set out for you. Here's your job description, if you will. 2 Timothy 2.15 Little of the old, a little of the new. 
2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent. What is diligence? It's consistency. It's not once in a while. It's not when I remember. It, it's every day. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman. You're working for the best boss there is does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth how well do you handle the word of truth or do you make up your own truth is truth what 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 the word declares is truth with no 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 back door no way in or out to to, to change it or, or reduce it in that same book in chapter 3 Verses 16 and 17 tell us. You know your assignment. Now here's your textbook. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. We could spend the rest of my time on each of those words, but you look them up, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. So that the man of God or woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. God has called you to good work. He hasn't just called you to work, he's called you to good work. Your classroom, your assignment is to study to show yourself approved. Your textbook is the Bible. Your classroom is the church. That's where you will be taught. That's where you will learn how to apply these things in the scripture. Your workplace is your world. Your sphere of influence. Your coaches, we find them in Ephesians 4, 2 verses 11 and 12. And he, Jesus, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Well, isn't that nice? We all love the titles, but with the title comes a responsibility. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Why do we study this word? Oh, so we can have an easy life? No. So your life can impact others. So your life can cause people to want to know why you have favor with a holy God. Why do things work out for you? Why is it even when you're in adversity or, or, or you get slammed, you have the strength? to stay with it because your God and his word have prepared you and they want it they want it so bad don't tell them what it costs tell them what it cost him so you have your coaches and finally your goal your goal is also in the next verse until we all attain to the unity of the faith why are we here assembled here this morning? Why is, is this group intermixed? Why didn't all the biker church sit in one place and all Word of Jesus sit in another and all WTMJ sit in a third place? Because we're one people, one church serving one God. You have your assignment. Um, Enjoy this holiday. Consider these things. Get ready to go back to kingdom work. Amen? Amen. Amen. You clap too early. All right, now, now you can clap. Because it's my pleasure. Will you please stand? I want to welcome my co-laborer and newfound son in the faith. Pastor Pierre, would you uh, give him a oh, welcome? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bonsoir, Eternel. Bonsoir, Eternel. Praise the Lord. All right, let me sit in. Thank you so much, Pastor Tom. Ah, uh, 15 minutes. Not by work, but
for good works. Amen. Not by works. Not by even good works. But for good works. You're talking about salvation. Not by works. You cannot and will ever do anything in this life to be saved. Not the good behavior. Not the well done doing good to others. It is only and only by the grace of God and the grace of God only. That needs to be said clearly. Because the very sick people will make you burn out. The very sick people will give you a false Jesus. A false gospel. The gospel that says is by grace alone, to step alone, in Christ alone, to Amen. Not by works. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how lovely you are. I don't care how generous you are. None of those things can save you. It's only by the grace of the living God or not. So not by works. But for good works. James talking about faith by works. No dilemma. Simple. Your salvation with God is by faith alone. Only God knows your heart. But how in the world I will know you are saved is by the way I see you. I know you can pretend we are good in that. Sometimes show something who are not. But my friend, we are the hands of God. We are the feet of God. We are the mouth of God. And the only way we can truly demonstrate God in our lives is by acting toward others in love. How in the world? You say you are a Christian. You are God, the Holy Spirit within you. And I cannot see with you. What's wrong with us? How in the world there is division only among us when we say we have one Father? We need to stop lying. One Father, one Savior, one Holy Spirit, and we cannot come together. Bully my power. Amen. <laughs> My brother and my sisters, it is time for the church to be alive. There is a Lord who is staying. And God came on us. And we are doing crimes. We are doing things that, you know, I cannot deal with that one. I cannot deal with that one. That one is black. That one is purple. That one is yellow. What's wrong with us? See that man, he has too much tattoo, he has been. What's wrong with all? The Bible said, look at your brother and sister according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. Yeah. 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 Don't look at you, according to who you are, you will be dead. That's why he said to us as brothers and sisters, he said, Take time for you because I can stay for three hours. <laughs> to look at your brothers. To look at your sisters. 
you're not my sister? I look at you because you're my sister. But I have to look at you, God, not according to your flesh, but who you truly are. And that will make us connected. That's the reason when I came to this church, the virgin, I see you, Pastor Tom, and we are been connected since that day. I hope that God, the home you give me, how at home I feel wash. <laughs> that was a real, true walk. But man, be merciful on me, I'm not that. <laughs> but I was true, because you see, what is that? I was so, I was in we are saved by Christ alone. To set alone. In Christ alone. For good works. And this is good works. We can do better as well to prove we are Lord, not in mass. Stop talking, talking. Walk the walk. Of your one church. One building. Pull it in the body, pull it to me when you come together and do something together. Because too much talking and people are dying. Too much talking and our kids cannot do anything because they see the hypocrisy in our lives. As we talk, we don't act accordingly. So, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, remember the Bible said in the book of Romans, it is by grace, it's grace alone, no works. Because it is by grace, if I am lost in it, it's no longer works. It's no longer grace. And if it is by work, it is a grace. If that grace is no longer grace. I am so grateful this morning. In Labor Day, I can say I am resting in the perfect finished work of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's what you need to remember. No work from you. It's what you have to have it then. And that's why on Calvary Cross, you say one word in Greek, which I say in English, it is finished. In French, it is finished. It is finished. One word in Greek, Tetelastai. I don't know when you say it is finished, if it is finished, but when Jesus said it is finished, it is finished. Yes, what? I am finished. Yes. 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 To my daughters, my big brother, who's going to give me another hug, the pastor, How do you follow that? I love it. I thought being last would be a good idea. <laughs> I didn't say I was finished. He said he was finished. <laughs> Amen. Um, first, before I use up what could be 15 minutes. Um, I want everybody to just understand and appreciate um, someone who, this was his vision for a long time. And that's my, my co-laborer, my co-pastor in the Biker Church, Pastor Spock. And I have
had a couple, 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 couple people came up to me a little earlier and said, you know, Pastor Spock mentioned this nice idea. And I said, you didn't say no, right? <laughs> well, this is what happens when Pastor Spock says he's got a good idea. Because a lot of people talk about doing things. And a lot of people want to bring things and give them to somebody else to do. But not that man. He basically says, uh, get out of my way. Because there's a tornado coming. Labor Day weekend. It's a uh, time of a new season. Amen? Uh, kind of for us bikers, it can kind of be a... Uh, not, a, not a, a great feeling because riding season on this part of the country is kind of winding down, but apparently not. And uh, how appropriate that today, I believe, we're bringing in a new season. Amen? Amen? amen. amen. We're Pentecostals here, so amening amen. can be a good thing. Yeah. All right? Um, because I don't walk around the aisles like Pastor Pierre does. So, but my, my talk today is, is, is entitled, A Labor of Love. And um, the definition of a labor of love is a piece of hard work that you do because you enjoy it. Not because you receive any money or any praise or because you need to do it. And, and this is what Jesus called us to do. Um, we've heard two pastors talk about working the good works and what we're to do through the Holy Spirit, not of our own volition. And so um, I think they brought more of an individual message. I'm bringing a message today more for the church in general. And for three churches here, this will be an encouraging message. But for ones outside of this realm, I want to bring a hard message because this can't just be here. And I was mentioning to Pastor Pierre, this is a special day, isn't it? Yeah. Do you realize it's not supposed to be a special day? What we're doing here today should be every day in the Christ-centered church all over the world, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And it's an indictment on the church big C, but an encouragement to three churches that have come to fellowship together. And so I want to leave, lay down a little foundation first before I get into the main point, which I think I'll be able to keep in the 15 minutes. I was going to put my phone here, but no. Romans chapter 13, verse 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. You see, the mind shift of the follower of Jesus is to get fulfillment and joy out of a life of righteousness, out of a life that glorifies Jesus Christ. That should be our joy. It should not be a labor. It should be a labor of love. Because we are saved, as the pastor so eloquently said, for good works. <clears throat> unto good works. And I think many of us, many of us in times of our life, we actually tried to, to be the Christian, didn't we? Uh, that didn't go well for me. You know, you try to be a Christian in your own strength and in your own will, um, you're going to break. And when you break, it's normally a public breaking. And uh, it's not pretty, and it's, it's humbling. And so as we, we know, you know, if you don't humble yourself, well, God's just happy to do that for you. And I've been there, done that, have the scars and, and things uh, behind me. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 says, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and still ministering to the saints. So according to Hebrews, our work of love is to minister to each other. I'm going to trust the writer of Hebrews rather than man and what church has really made things. And God is not just speaking to individuals. He's also speaking to churches to love each other and to serve each other. 
and to be with each other. And this is the hard work, isn't it? It's the hardest work because we're all different. Even in one church, being unified is a challenge. As a pastor, and all pastors here understand this, at any given time we got stuff going on between people in our church. And we need to have an understanding to, to teach our people that you need to come together, whether you're the offender or the offendee. And if you really have the heart of Christ, you work that out. And you love each other. And you don't change each other, but you love each other through your individual personalities, likings, and whatever. And I propose the same thing for the church. The church has been divided because we don't like how that church praises. And we don't like how that church looks. And they have an accent over there. And we got a different accent over here. See, the words that pop into my head are not as graceful as Pastor Pierre. Uh, I don't know what it's bologna or whatever, macaroni or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Many of us, maybe all of us, have things in our life that we really view as a labor of love. You know, some people like to uh, garden. So a woman out here yesterday for I don't even know how many hours. And, and the labor of love of, of putting every flower and everything in its place. To me, that's hard labor. Uh, I don't like gardening. So to me, to do anything is work as far as going outside and, and doing anything. But what's worked for me is a labor of love to someone else. You know, uh, washing and polishing our cars or our motorcycles. You know, I own a motorcycle, but I don't worship my motorcycle. All right? I got friends who spend seven hours with Q-tips, getting in every cranny of the chrome. All right? And I'm looking at them as like, I got better things to do with my time. And I don't enjoy that. But to him, it's a labor of love. And I'm not saying he worships the motorcycle, but he really understands the motorcycle is something that really brings joy and peace in his life. Landscaping, cleaning our apartment and decorating. Not that I'm thinking of anyone. <laughs> uh, to me, it's work, but to other people, it's, it's a joy. And um, sports, working out. Tony just works out because he likes to work out. I think he's nuts. Because they call it working out. All right? I could do the out part as long as there's not work involved. And so we all have these things we enjoy. But the thing is, when we belong to Jesus Christ, the, the labor that we do, the things we do, have to be a labor of love. And that can only come through the transformation of the Holy Spirit. And most of our labor of love is getting along. You know, how many people find it's easier to go out and talk to other people rather than kind of talk to people in the church all the time because they just annoy you when they got attitudes? You know? And, and the thing about church is we're stuck with each other. If I meet somebody in the street and I don't like what they say, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll never see you again. But now we got church. And really the body of Christ needs to be the same thing. We got individual churches that need to get along and they need to work things out because nobody has the right to be done. I'm tired of hearing people say I'm done. I'm done with them. I'm done with that. We don't have a right to be done. All right. Jesus is the one that decides when we're done. And so we need to get to the point where we enjoy doing the things of God, the works of God. Romans 12, 1 says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. This may be the ultimate of us surrendering our life and giving our life over as a surrender. It is not looking out for our rights, what we like, what makes us happy, but to look to others. 
and to look even as a church to other churches and encourage them to do what they're called to do for God. This is the labor of love for the true believer. Laying our rights and our individuality down to come together. And what I want to talk about in a second is we don't give up our individuality, but we don't allow that to make us individuals. We allow it to help us be all nations, all tongues, all people, one Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so at, at the woman of the well story, Jesus has this thing he says that totally baffles the, the apostles. They come back from, uh, I don't know, stop and shop, uh, Lidl. They went to the market to get some food. Jesus has the encounter. And he's not hungry anymore. But what does he say? He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. See, the labor we do for the kingdom has a sustaining of the things that we need in our life. They fulfill something. They fulfill a need. And we need to all get to that point. That point. This should be our labor of love. But does the church feel that way? Does the church live that way? Because that is the will of the Father. And I think that's the problem is we tend to want to do our will and make God fit into what our will is. And just as it is individually, it happens corporately with individual churches. Wanting their will for their church to supersede God's will for the church. Thank God for this day. Thank God for what he's doing here. Because we need to accomplish his work. And so, I want to transition to really what I want to talk about for the rest of my time, whatever that works out to be. <laughs> God gave us the ultimate example of a labor of love, didn't he? God so loved the world. See, a labor of love is not to our own benefit. We love, need to love to do the things of God for the kingdom of God and for the church of Jesus Christ. But just like in the story of the woman of the well, we need to have unity in Christ be one of the things that sustains us and thrills us. That there is a yearning and there's a hunger in us for unity. Because it's the most important thing. And the scripture I'm going I'm to bring now really heightens what we're doing today. And I hope convicts many out there in other churches that are listening. Because time is short. The age is winding down. People are going to hell every day. Eventually God will pull the, pull the plug on this project. And when Jesus comes, we're leaving a lot of people behind. And it's all up to us. In Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, verses 17 to 21, Jesus talking to God, his Father, says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may themselves also be sanctified in the truth. I don't ask on the behalf of these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me, folks, in case you haven't realized that in the scriptures. That they may be one, even as you, Father, and I are one. That they may be in us and with us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. And... I want to concentrate on the last part of that scripture because that is the entirety of our mission. Jesus only said one thing in the scriptures that he said, by this the world will know that you sent me. And it's when the church is one as him and the Father are one. And that's why today is a celebration of showing the world what Jesus said the world needs to see. Missions are good. Feeding the homeless are good. 
all the works we do out there in service. But look out in the world, there's other faiths, there's secular groups doing a lot of those things too. Unity cannot be fabricated by the world. That's why the enemy has worked through our country and through the world specifically lately to rip us apart. Not even just denominations, but churches and faiths and families, vax, unvax, mask, no mask, all this stuff. One purpose, to create a chaos in the kingdom of God. The Satan doesn't care what the world does. He cares what you and I do. And so he's trying to create a realm where he can destroy unity and mass, knowing that many churches will fall victim under their own volition. And we dare not do that. What we're doing here today is the ultimate proof to the world that God sent Jesus into the world. Give yourself a praise offering. Give Jesus a hand. This is what it's all about. This is what Jesus came to establish a church. Not to just go out and heal people and deliver people. But by this, the world will know that he was sent by the Father. It's the one thing the church has lost the grasp of. We can be good at the other things and think ourselves good. But we're not doing the one thing Jesus called us to do. Because it's hard. There are people here in the same church that have conflicts with other people here in the same church. We need to get over ourselves. These three churches start in a good in a good a good realm. But let us not fool ourselves. Satan will try to come in and separate us. Because he hates what's happening here today. But we're going to stay one. Amen. People are different in general. We're all individual, but we all belong to Jesus. Amen. We have the heart of God and we have to dig deep to heal, peacefully work through what separates us and be in unity. Because that is to be in Christ. That is the work we do together. That is the only work that matters. How much greater the challenges for churches? It's like the Hatfield and McCoys. Family feud. You know? And Satan is laughing. Laughing at us. Because he don't care about the good works he do. If we're not unified, the world's not going to see Jesus. So he laughs. We make it about other things. We've been trying for six years since we've been in this building. Along with Pastor Tom and Word of Jesus. We see two churches come and go. And we've tried. Unity has to be important to three units. Ecclesiastic tells us that the one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a cord of three stands is not easily broken. And we have two other opportunities, and, and one just disassembled. The other one got absorbed into a, a church that has many campuses. I'm very opinionated. If you don't know that, you're going to find out today. I don't believe in mega churches. I have a problem with one man trying to start multiple campuses. Whose kingdom are we building? When people get absorbed into another big experience, they lose their identity. They lose their individuality. What good is one church with diversity all watered down because they're trying to conform to a commonality? WTGF, WTMJ, needs to hold their identity and be individuals and to be unique in their own way. Where Jesus needs to be unique and in their own way, not to change for unity's sake. Because we're not called to be unified by watering down each other's tendencies so we can become a, a misogynistic kind of, well, let's all have a unified thing and We'll lay some things aside. I love that we sang words today. I have no idea what they said. <laughs> but my spirit knew exactly what they were singing about. You know? And we celebrate with them. We celebrate the differences. We celebrate the dynamic. And that's the way the church has to be. But it's greater challenges. This is the big challenge for the church. 
this cord is not going to be broken. It's not going to be broken. Matter of fact, when you have three and one doesn't want, it's a detriment. It's even damaging the whole. And that's not to condemn those two churches. They need to make the right thing the right thing. And they've come and gone. As soon as I met Pastor Pierre, <laughs> love is who we are. Amen? Biker churches, love what we are? That's what we do. And sometimes I get the impression that when you embrace someone, they're thrown into a place of shock because nobody ever did that before. And that's an indictment on the church. We should be doing this all the time with each other, other churches, other people, different colors, different dress. It doesn't matter. And I remember the reaction when I hugged that man. And I had two things that went through me. I was so thrilled with just the love that we had, which has just gotten bigger. You know, and I'm going to start speaking a different language, I think, soon. <laughs> but I felt, and I feel it sometimes with other churches, that they lack the fellowship of other fellowships because of the differences and because people want to be separate from other kinds of people. And this is an indictment on the church, big C. But in here, it's an encouragement. Because there can't be three churches more different than us. You know? We got a picture that, that one of our, our women made of all three of us, and it's like the odd triplets. <laughs> so the American church needs to take notice. This cannot stay here. This has to become a movement. And so the next time that we get together and do this, and we've already talked about this being an annual thing, at least this, <laughs> but we're going to do all the things together is that these need to be happening everywhere. Amen? And so the word of Jesus needs to remain the word of Jesus. I got two minutes. I'm on my last page. I got hit. We need to be separate, but one. We need to celebrate each other. Not a homogenized, watered-down version of our diversity. But when we step into that other fellowship hall, we get a taste of a different nation, a different tongue, a different people. But one spirit, one Lord, one Savior. Denominations, black churches, white churches, Asian churches, they may be the most isolated of them all, and maybe we can do something about that. But three fellowships in one. I want to end. This is the real close. People know I got like five closes on it. We're going to have communion now. And I've said this for a long time because I did a study of communion because I know what we do, we know what it represents. And I always wonder where the word communion come from? You know? It's like we, we're celebrating the death and, and burial of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice and, and, and the gospel. Uh, communion. It seems like this word they just picked out of, out, of, out of the sky and put it in there. But communion really represents what Jesus came to give us, and that's the kingdom of God. It's not about us being saved individually. It's not about our churches being together individually. Jesus died, and he went to the cross, and he walked out of the grave. To create one church, a commune of fellowship in Jesus Christ. That's the backstory of communion. He didn't create so each one of us could be individually saved. He went to the cross so that the kingdom could be brought down to earth. And the kingdom has many nations, many tongues, many people, one kingdom. And so uh, I want to ask Pastor Tom and Pastor Pierre to come up. I have no idea what we're going to do, but Pastor Spock wrote it in the agenda, and, and we're supposed to be up here doing something. Well, yeah, what are you doing? I'm here to say I am really going to enjoy that breakfast. 
Oh, okay. Oh, right. But let me just say, and I, and I couldn't get all this into the 15 minutes that we agreed. Because we don't like to sit in here all, all, all this time. But, no, but, again, Pastor Ski and I met because we were attending a group uh, for a men's ministry. And it was a great idea, and it was bringing men from all different churches together. And we met, and we connected. But the day that Pastor Pierre walked in with Pastor Eddie um, at the end of our service, I looked at him, I said, are, are you Haitian? He said, yes. I said, Venezuela, do now. <laughs> and he jumped into my arms. Because having been in Haiti on, on two mission trips, one for a pastor's conference, um, I learned a, a, a little bit about it. And I didn't welcome him because he was Haitian. I welcomed him because he was my brother. Okay. Yeah, when Pastor Tom met me, he said, Lemon Skinner, ZZ Top. <laughs> there you go. Anyway. Yeah. All right, I know it's time now to, to do communion. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Pastor uh, Denise, Pastor Johnny, to join us. And they're going to help us with communion. And then after that, we're going to celebrate together with our brothers. Yes, we're going to sit down and then okay. we're going to let the woman do it by themselves. One thing to this, to this group. Not only are three churches gathered together, but six pastors are represented, are here. Elders of the churches are here. Deacons, ministers, people who have said yes, we will serve. So we're just building a bullpen and we're ready for the World Series for Jesus. Amen. Amen. And they accuse women of talking. <laughs> We're about to partake of a very um, solemn um, act. In fact, um, it's really a covenant meal. And not, I'm not going to go into a teaching about covenant, but a covenant cannot be broken. Amen. You know, and God established a covenant with His church, and it cannot be broken. And what we're doing with communion is to remember that we're partaking in a covenant meal. Okay, it's a very serious um, uh, act that we're doing. And I just want to say, I want to. Um, just interject that if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, or if you are not right with a brother or a sister in the Lord, please examine your heart. This is very serious because God takes his covenants very serious. Okay, so, and, and if you don't know the Lord and, and you want to know more, you can see one of the ushers afterwards and they would be happy to direct you to someone who can can lead you in, uh, in the knowledge of Christ, okay? So it's a time where we reflect and we search our hearts. And I love in the scriptures where it, it calls this, what we're about to do, the Lord's Supper. Because in my heart, in my mind, I come from a big Italian family, you know, supper, and we shared a meal. I mean, it was a big deal. And this is a big deal to Jesus. Because we're remembering his death. We're remembering the sacrifice that he made on the cross. We're remembering what he suffered. And we're partaking together in unity for this service, in unity, um, and, and reflecting on just what that means. So take the time to search your heart. 
to make sure that you're right with God, that there isn't anything in your heart that you're harboring, so we can receive the grace and the blessings that come with partaking in this meal. Amen. So I'm going to um, just speak about the bread, um, and bread representing the body of Christ, the bread representing um, all that sustains us for life. And we have that in the Lord. We have that in Jesus. We have everything we need to sustain us for this life. We have everything we need to propel us into our destiny and then ultimately into the kingdom of our God when we go home to be with the Lord. So it's important that we take this in unity with that mindset. Amen. It's a holy, holy act that we're doing. Amen. Amen. We know that the scriptures tell us that life is in the blood. Amen. And the Bible tells us that from before the foundations of the world, Jesus Christ was slain for us. And throughout the Old Testament, we see pictures of the necessity beginning with um, Cain and Abel. We see pictures of, of the necessity of blood being shed so that sins could be forgiven. And Jesus, from before the foundations of the world, was slain for us. His blood was shed for us. But it had to, if I could say it this way, play itself out in time. Until that time, right, there were turtle doves and sheep were being slain by the high priest once a year for a family. But that was a picture, that was a type of what Jesus was going to do. Jesus was going to come to earth. He was going to die on the cross. And, and every, all of our pastors said it as a labor of love. He, he chose to lay his life down for each and every one of us. Even the Bible says, while we were yet sinners. Amen. So as we partake of the, the, the cup today, let's remember what it represents. It represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, the spotless Lamb of God. Amen. So we can take our cups. For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, the scriptures tell us that Jesus took the cup and he lifted it up and he said, this cup is representative of my blood shed for you. Let's take the cup together.
I have the privilege of saying a benediction. Benediction is a, is a word that was made from two Latin words. Bene meaning good and diction meaning speech. And any good speech is a short one. So it, we bless the food, but we want to bless you for coming out, for being part, for tasting and seeing what God can do when we surrender and line up behind him and find out what he's doing and then walk in it. And my brother, we so appreciate, not an idea, but an idea becomes a plan, becomes executed, and it becomes an event. This is not a event. This is a supper and a meal for the family of God. And we come together. And um, I just bless the people in Jesus' name. All right, we got one more, one little surprise guest speaker. I promise it won't be too long because I'll have to be. <laughs> I'm going to pray over the food, but wasn't this an amazing event? Yeah. But there's one thing that wasn't done that I'm going to ask. I want you to look to your right and look to your left. Do you know what you're looking at? You're looking at your siblings. Because we are the children of God. Chosen through adoptionship. Let us pray for another thing. This is a building facing the church. This is the church. Yes. This is the building. Yes. Keep that in mind and take it with you. Let us pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for blessing us this morning with three fellowship, distinct, but one body of Christ, one church. As we are about to partake in what you have gracefully provided to us, I ask, Father God, that you remind us to stay with a perpetual spirit of thanksgiving and give you thanks in everything as we partake in what you have given to us. Nourish us, our bodies, with the food and your spirit for our bodies and our spirit. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let us eat.